Once again, we're thankful that you've taken the opportunity and the time out of your day or evening to join us for this short Bible study. If you have your Bible, you can take it out and you can search the scriptures with us. Our primary text uh, for this study is going to be from the book of Numbers chapter 13 and a few verses of Numbers chapter 14. Our subject matter deals with the dangers of unbelief. It may be that there are people, uh, even some among God's people, who maybe do not know or appreciate the dangers of unbelief, a lack of faith or trust in God. And so in this chapter or these chapters, uh, we learn about the dangers of unbelief. To set the scene for us, you go back in the Old Testament and you look at Old Testament history. As the book of Genesis comes to a close, we're reading about uh, Joseph and how his brothers treated him and how he was sold by them to a band of traitors and taken to Egypt and those latter, part, uh, latter chapters of Genesis deal with Joseph's time uh, in Egypt. And ultimately, the narrative uh, tells us the works of Joseph in Egypt and how later he was reunited with his family and they uh, had moved to Egypt. They were given a parcel of land uh, by Pharaoh. But as time goes along and generations come and go, the Hebrew people, while in Egypt, grew to a mighty number. And, of course, Pharaoh would view them as a threat to the Egyptian kingdom or to his reign. And so he would force them into hard servitude. And when you think about transitioning from the period of the patriarchs to the next Bible period, which is the Exodus, we always think about, uh, did they stay in Egypt forever? And the answer is no, they didn't stay in Egypt forever. And so, hence, they exited. Uh, they departed from Egypt. Their ultimate destination was the promised land. And as you arrive in the book of Numbers, so you go through the book of the latter part of Genesis into Exodus, Leviticus, then Numbers. Uh, we arrive at Numbers chapter 13. By the time we come to Numbers chapter 13, Israel uh, has been out in the wilderness journeying from, the promise, from Egypt to the promised land for about, we'll say, 12 months. Almost one year it would take them to go from Egypt to the southern border of the promised land. And so when they arrive, uh, they are at Kadesh Barnea, and they choose one man from each tribe, so there would be 12 men in all, who would be sent into the promised land, and they would spy it out. And they were to come back and give a report to Israel. And so here's what happened. In Numbers 13, and in verse 26, it says, Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Enoch there. And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. In verse 30, then Caleb quiets the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Notice, by the way, in that passage, they said, We are not able. Compare and contrast that with Caleb and Joshua, who wanted to go immediately. And it says in verse 32, this is the ten spies, save Joshua and Caleb, right? Which would make twelve. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. All the people whom we saw in it are men of stature. And if you read in chapter 14, uh, we know that they cried out against Moses. And so what happened? The 12 spies go in. They spy the land. They come back. And 10 of them gave a negative report, a bad report. Essentially what they said was, we can't. They didn't believe that they could go in and take possession of the land. Despite God having promised it to them. And that God would be with them. And that God would help them conquer the land. 
Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, had faith and trust in God, and they wanted to go immediately. But if you read Numbers 13 and four, chapters, Numbers chapter 13 and 14 closely, you'll note how the ten spies' negative or bad report influenced Israel as a whole. And so we're going to look at some of those dangers that we see from uh, this narrative in Numbers 13 and Numbers chapter 14. First of all, one of the dangers is to lack faith in God. In the book of Acts chapter 7, it was Stephen who will narrate the history that is in the first century. He'll narrate part of Israel's history. He goes back to the Old Testament and talks about various aspects of their time in the Old Testament. And so he reminds them that God brought Israel out of Egypt. And he says, and I quote in Acts 7 and 36, after he had gone down, after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea, God had shown wonders. God had shown or proven himself and his power to these people. Think about the plagues. You think about the Red Sea. You think about their time that they had journeyed from Egypt to the border of the promised land. If you look at Numbers 14 and verse 2, it says, And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not, they said, right, would it not have been better for us to return to Egypt? They looked back to Egypt. You might compare and contrast that with, say, for example, David's attitude when he went up against Goliath. When David goes out onto the battlefield, he proclaims that he has come in the name of the Lord. He knows that God is with him. He knows that God will grant him the victory. That would be in 1 Samuel 17, verses 43 through 46. It's interesting that throughout the Psalms, the, the various psalmists, actually make a number of references back to these specific events in Numbers 13 and 14. For example, in Psalm 78 and verse 22, the psalmist actually mentions Israel's unbelief. The psalmist mentions this danger, that is, lack of faith in God. And the psalmist said, because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his salvation. God over and over had demonstrated himself to be faithful, powerful, just, and upright. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, we learn that faith is essential, in this case, to salvation, or in any case, to pleasing God. In Hebrews 11 and verse 6, it says that for without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Or in John 8 and 24, Jesus taught on the necessity of faith when he said that if you believe not that I am me, that I am he, you shall die in your sins. And so put your faith and trust in God. One of the very real dangers of unbelief is a lack of faith in God. God has demonstrated himself to us even today just as much as he did to those in the first century. Matter of fact, you probably could make an argument maybe even more so to us because we have God's word in its completeness today. And so we have both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And in his word, God has revealed himself, his character, his uprightness, that he's just and faithful and true is demonstrated from beginning to end. Notice danger number two. The second danger of unbelief would be that to lack trust in God's word. Listen to what God tells Moses in Exodus 3 and verse 8. God said to Moses that he had come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land to a land flowing with milk and honey. Exodus 3 and verse 8. Did God not mean exactly what he said? And so when Israel refuses to invade and conquer in Numbers chapter 13 and 14, they lack trust in God's word. Remember those quotes in the Psalms? Here's another one. In Psalm 106 and verse 24, the psalmist made mention of Israel's lack of trust saying, 
They despised the pleasant land. They did not believe his word. In John 17, when Jesus was praying for himself and then later his disciples, he said in John 17, verse 17 to God, his father, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. God's word is truthful. God means exactly what he says and says what he means, or he says what he means, and right? He means what he says. God's word is truth. We ought to be like the psalmist in Psalm 119 and verse 42. I will trust in your word. God's word is infallible. That is that it that is that it is without error. It cannot fall. God's, God's word is absolute. And when Israel in Numbers 13 refused to invade and conquer the promised land, when those 10 spies who came back and said, we can't, and that their report influenced Israel as a whole, and they refused to invade and conquer, they lacked trust in God's word. They lacked faith in God. Notice the third danger. How about to sow the seeds of doubt? In Numbers chapter 13 and verse 31, Remember what they said? We are not able. That doubt. When they come back, those ten spies come back and give that report in the midst of Israel, they are sowing seeds of doubt. The ten, they declare themselves outmatched physically. They report that there's giants in the land, and maybe there are giants in the land. And maybe they do have large cities and fortified cities. But those were things, those things could not stop God. God is all powerful. Surely God could overcome those giants, those cities, walled cities, and large cities. They failed to take into account, account God's work that he had done in their very presence in Egypt and during their departure. They didn't hearken back to those things that God had done. And think about, wow, if God can do that, then surely he can do this. There are a lot of folks today who continue to sow seeds of doubt. They do so when they teach various theories of men as fact, such as evolution or the Big Bang Theory. The Bible says in the beginning, God, Genesis 1 and verse 1. One of the very real dangers of unbelief is sowing seeds of doubt. That my unbelief actually could influence others to live a life of unbelief. Israel as a whole gave heed to that negative or bad report and refused to enter and invade and conquer the promised land. Remember what Jesus told Peter in First Peter or in Matthew 14, 31? Oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? You know, rather than sowing seeds of doubt, we ought to be busy sowing the seed, the word of God, Luke 18 and verse 11, in the parable of the sower. God's word is real. And his word is powerful, powerful enough to save us. Romans 1, 16, Paul said, uh, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Paul, why are you not ashamed of it? He wasn't ashamed of it because he knew that it was the power of God unto salvation. Let me give you one more. The dangers of unbelief. How about do not get to enter the promised land? In Numbers 13, when Israel refused to invade and conquer, God said that those unfaithful individuals would die in the wilderness. God had sentenced them to wander in the wilderness. It would come to a total of about 40 years. In Numbers 14 and verse 29, Listen to what God says. God says, the carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. And then in verse 33, and your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness 40 years and bear the brunt of your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. 40 years was long enough for an unfaithful generation to die. And God said that their children would grow, would rise up and be the ones who would invade and conquer the promised land. And later we would learn that in the Old Testament narrative that it would be Joshua who would succeed Moses as Israel's leader who would lead the people. And Joshua would be the one to lead Israel's men of war across the Jordan into the promised land and invade and conquer the promised land. In the book of Hebrews chapter 3 
If you look at Hebrews chapter 3 and starting in verse number 15, the Hebrew writer says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. There's a lot of quotes in the Old Testament, even some in the New Testament, that look back to these events. Furthermore, for who, having heard rebel, indeed was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. They didn't enter in because... Do you see the dangers of unbelief? They did not. They could not because of unbelief. Jesus said in John 8, 24, that we today would die in our sins if we did not believe in him. We will not be, enter, be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven. If we don't, do not believe. And of course, biblical belief is not just a, a mental exercise, but that our belief in God is accompanied by obedience to God's authoritative voice. The New Testament, through and through, teaches that the unrighteous will not enter the kingdom of God. And you could find passages like Matthew 7, 21, Paul in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9. By the way, the promised land of heaven belongs to them that believe and obey God. A heart of unbelief will keep us from entering the glories, the eternal glories of heaven. And those who exercise a heart of belief will respond to the commands of God in obedience. Hebrews 5, 9, Jesus became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him you know the dangers of unbelief are as real as tangible objects just as real as this lectern is or just as real as the image is on the screen behind me so too are the dangers of unbelief and so in numbers chapter 13 and 14 and as you read about the spies and they go in they spy the land they come back they fall into two categories those that gave a bad report, those that gave a good report. Unfortunately, the majority fell into the category of the bad or evil report, 10 of them. And so they influenced Israel. And as a whole, they refused to invade and conquer on that occasion. And so in these chapters, here, here are the dangers of unbelief, right? If, if I do not believe and trust in God, if I do not submit to his authoritative voice, I lack faith in God. God has given us everything we need to know about him. That there's a mountain of evidence that supports his existence. That supports that he is real. And that indeed he is omniscient and omnipotent. And yet when I have a heart of unbelief, I lack faith in God. I lack trust in God's word. God's word is infallible. Read it. It is without error. It's amazing that some 40 writers over a span of 1,500 years wrote the Bible. And they're all in agreement. There's one unifying theme, the scheme of redemption, that would come through Jesus the Christ. God's word is truthful. It is real. But if I have a heart of unbelief, I, I lack trust in God's word. I sow seeds of doubt. What kind of seed do you like to sow? Hopefully it'll be seeds of belief. Knowing that the power of God's word and God himself and Jesus can change the hearts and lives of men for good. So we ought to be sowing the word of God. We ought to be sowing seeds of faith and not seeds of doubt as they did with those, as did the 10 spies in Numbers 13 and 14. And ultimately, the last danger is do not get to enter the promised land. For those in Moses' day here in Numbers 13 and 14, they didn't get to enter that land, that physical land that God had promised to Abraham's descendants. Those that were unfaithful, rebellious, died in the wilderness. And so for us, if we want to enter into the eternal kingdom of heaven, then we have to have faith in God, trust in God, and obey God. If I do not, I'm not going to get to enter into the promised land. And so may each of us seek God, trust in him, submit to his rule, and 
obey his commands. Appreciate very much, once again, you taking the time out of your day uh, to join us for this short Bible study.